Can you believe that 1992 was 32 years ago? That was the year the iconic theme song of X-Men the Animated Series invaded living rooms around the world and woke up a new generation to the weird and wonderful world of the X-Men in the form of the timeless classic animated series. You may have heard that it has been rebooted and X-Men 97 debuted this month. So why don't we take a trip back and revisit the original X-Men animated series to learn some facts that you might not have known about the show, its development and how it broke the mold in bringing the comic books and characters to life and would be instrumental in shaping the public's image of the various heroes and villains of the X-Men mythos for years to come. X-Men The Animated Series was the second attempt to make an animated version of the X-Men comics. The first was a half-hour special titled Pride of the X-Men, meant as a pilot for a future series, but was so poorly received it was said to have almost killed any chances of a series being developed. Having championed the Pride of the X-Men pilot in 1989, Fox Kids Vice Chairman Margaret Loesch bargained for a second chance, promising not to make the same mistakes as Pride of the X-Men. Loesch brought in Chaim Saban to produce the show and also hired Eric Lewalt to be the executive story producer. Added to the team was comic book writer Bob Harris as a consultant on the show and later, after the first season, saw the inclusion of comic book writer Len Wein who had revived the X-Men comic book series in the 1970s after it ended in the 1960s. By the time he joined, Wein was already a fan of the series, appreciating how much it respected the original material. Bob Harris had brought in a staff of comic book geeks who were huge fans of the X-Men comics and who vowed to take the X-Men characters seriously and to stay true to the original comics in an attempt to help new audiences connect with the X-Men who, at the time, were relatively unfamiliar outside the comic book realm. The writer's main goal was to emulate the experience of reading the actual comics rather than delivering a dumbed-down version as it had been done in the past by previous Marvel shows. That necessitated more complex stories with drawn-out character arcs and, as a result, created continuity between the episodes, developing a larger story. The comics themselves were the inspiration for the serialized format, and other writers on the team cited I, Claudius and Lonesome Dove as inspirations for serialized storytelling. There were concerns about how the younger demographic would deal with an episode that ended in a cliffhanger, as well as viewers who missed previous episodes. The solution to this was the previously on X-Men recap, which is now common practice. Animation-wise, the producers chose the look of Jim Lee's run on the comics as they felt he had a modern, sophisticated look to the characters. The production was under pressure to use computer-generated imagery, and rather than clumsily introduce CGI into the series, as would happen with Iron Man and Spider-Man, the production decided to end the credits with CGI models of the characters that would also explain their powers. Animation was outsourced to South Korean studio Acom, whose biggest claim to fame is the overseas animation of more than 200 episodes of The Simpsons. Despite having a clear vision, the series ran into constant production problems. The series was developed on an increasingly small budget and corners were cut wherever possible. When Acom turned in the first episode, it contained several animation errors, which they refused to fix. Because of time constraints, the episode was aired in an unfinished form. When Fox re-aired the pilot in early 1993, the errors were corrected. The original voice recordings came across as very young and cartoonish, and the entire voice cast was replaced with classically trained actors to establish a new, more mature and serious tone. Early in production, Stan Lee tried to be the narrator of the series as he had done for Spider-Man and his amazing friends, The Incredible Hulk and Pride of the X-Men. Lee wanted to host the series similar to Walt Disney's hosting of The Wonderful World of Disney, and the producers had the awkward task of having to talk Lee out of the role. Stan Lee's original vision for the show resembled something closer to the original comics of the 1960s with a teen vibe, but the series' writers instead decided to go with the mature, gritty intensity of the 1970s. Throughout the production of the series, there was constant pressure from Marvel to dumb it down, making it younger and sillier, as well as fears and anxieties that the scripts weren't funny or were too dark. Producers had to deal with quality control issues, attempts to cut costs, and persistent requests to change the tone of the series to a more child-friendly one, as well as to integrate toys into each episode. 
These anxieties continued up until the airing of the first episode. X-Men the Animated Series debuted in the US in October 1992, earning top ratings throughout its first season and was renewed for a second season of 13 episodes. In fact, the show was originally planned to run for 65 episodes, but as a result of its success, 11 more episodes were funded, albeit with a reduced budget due to Marvel's bankruptcy at the time. X-Men featured a team of superheroes similar to that of the early 1990s X-Men comics by Jim Lee, specifically the Blue Team established early on in X-Men Volume 2. In the Marvel Universe, mutants are humans who are born with a genetic trait called the X-Gene which grants them natural superhuman abilities, generally manifesting during puberty. Due to their differences from the majority of humanity, mutants are subject to prejudice and discrimination. And the series, like the comic book, deals with a variety of mature social issues, including divorce, loneliness, religion, particularly Christianity, as well as historical events like the AIDS hysteria. Plenty of famous comic book storylines appeared throughout the series, and in addition, numerous episodes featured references to particular comics. While developing the series, there were certain characters the producers felt were obvious inclusions. Cyclops, Wolverine, Rogue, Storm, Beast, Jean Grey, and Professor X, while Marvel pushed for the inclusion of Gambit as he had been recently introduced. The writing staff decided to pass on Kitty Pride in favor of Jubilee for the teenager role, and Pride was one of the few characters not to make any appearance, being the only major member of the X-Men to not appear. She had been the center of the failed Pride of the X-Men pilot, and Pride became the scapegoat for this failure. Marvel voted against the inclusion of Beast, which is why he was arrested early on in the series and spent the majority of the first season in jail. However, the more the staff continued writing him, the more they wanted to feature him. And after the first season, both sides agreed to keep Beast and he was freed from literal and figurative jail. Fox Kids pushed for the inclusion of a strong character of Pala, which was Bishop. And in the spirit of inclusion, the series was one of the first to feature a large number of females on the team, with women making up four of the nine members, which also reflected the high number of females among the writing staff. Despite the production difficulties and the doom and gloom from Marvel and Fox Kids, the series became the top-rated children's show on television, bringing in viewership ratings usually only seen on primetime, and also went on to become the longest-running Marvel comic show. Moreover, X-Men is consistently ranked among the highest of animated superhero series and is cited by the majority of fans as being the quintessential X-Men animated series. While preparing for the first X-Men film, director Brian Singer watched the entire series rather than engaging in the 40-year comic book history, and two of the staff writers were brought in as consultants for the first film. X-Men, along with Batman the Animated Series, was the first to tell serious adult stories which appealed to audiences of all ages. But X-Men is a different show compared to Batman. It's a show of grey areas. The villains are sympathetic, and the good guys have bad days. The heroes fight each other, are capable of being petty and intolerant, and sometimes even leave the X-Men in disgust to join the other side. What the show did more than anything else was to stick to its principles in staying true to the original comic books, to give its audience a huge amount of credit in believing it can handle serious and sometimes difficult topics, and above all, gave the viewer the impression they are reading a comic book rather than watching a cartoon. X-Men has been rebooted, and X-Men 97 debuted this month. Like its predecessor, X-Men 97 has had production problems of its own, but let's hope it defies expectations and matches the high watermark set by X-Men 92. Who knows, it might even be better. That's all we have time for for today, but please let us know in the comments what your memories are of X-Men 92 and how it compared to the comic books. And also let us know if you've watched any episodes of X-Men 97 and how it compares so far to the original. While we add it, everyone has their favorite, so who was your favorite X-Men character and why was it Storm? Please like this video if you've learned something today and make sure to subscribe for more content like this. I'll be back soon with some more cartoon history, so until then thank you as always for watching and stay tuned for more videos coming soon.